passing on Twitch as well. Um, okay. Uh, evening all. Is the audio okay? And board okay? Uh, should be. Um, please uh, use the opening book tab if there's any guest to move uh, quizzes during these games. Okay. Uh, so I thought we'd carry on looking at the 1992 Olympiad. Um, and we'll look at Kasparov and Kramnik in this session. Uh, we looked at some games of, of Kasparov um, two weeks ago. And uh, last week we were looking at Nakamura as an interlude. But we're going back to the 1992 Chess Olympiad, which I've got fascination with. Um, so you might ask, okay, why have I got a fascination with these Kasparov and Olympiads? Well, I think he really, really tried hard to win, you know, against uh, other teams. So interestingly, Ivanchuk was actually playing um, for the old USSR team uh, before the split. So he's playing board one for the Ukraine. So actually, this might be the highest rated opponent Kasparov ever faced up to that point, uh, who's rated 2720 at the time, Vasily Ivanchuk. 2720. Kasparov was 2780. Uh, but he had the advantage of the white pieces here. So let's have a look at this game. Uh, so it's the 1992 Olympiad um, in uh, June, uh, on the 16th of June, uh, the 30th Olympiad. So knight f3, c5. So Kasparov starting with knight f3 he can transpose into all sorts of things. If he wanted to, he could play e4 here and we have a Sicilian defence. But actually he plays c4 so we have an english opening um, and it could get very symmetrical and it does so here we have symmetry uh, something we're all dreading now uh, seeing in any game after the current after the world championship match games we've seen uh, i think a lot of people are more aware of of, of things like symmetrical pawn structures now uh, so anyway g3 uh, d6 uh, bishop g2 g6 okay but now a, uh, a break in the symmetry thankfully d4 by Kasparov and um, black takes on d4 knight takes d4 so there's pressure immediately exerted on c6 here black doesn't really want to play knight takes d4 I guess because that would be a powerfully centralized queen here instead he uh, plays bishop d7 okay and we have a kind of moroxy bind here this moroxy bind uh, against this pawn structure uh, binding that d5 but uh, can black you know generate counterplay on the dark squares uh, that's a usual source of counterplay or against c4 if the bishop's over here c4 is sometimes more vulnerable sometimes there's breaks for black with b5 later thematically so against this pawn structure obviously uh, there are a variety of thematic ideas so let's see how this game pans out bishop g7 and actually this knight's not allowed to hop around uh, to e5 later it's immediately taken actually it's taken here knight takes c6 okay and um okay so you might think b takes looks okay getting a pawn to the center but actually bishop takes was was used instead uh, which looks reasonable as well can't argue with a 2720 anyway so bishop e3 and um okay white has that still that moxy bind both sides castle and now a5 which okay increases a grip on on the dark squares and maybe later c5 might be you know a maneuver without the hassle of b4s uh once c3 is protected in fact c the c3 knight is protected here rook c1 uh but i'm sure there's quite a few points to rook c1 um curiously though even plays a4 here gaining a little bit more space and maybe you know queen a5 is an idea in fact that that's what it introduces and 
this this move which is introduced as a possibility appears on the board actually after queen e2 we see queen a5 okay now with the knight protected you would imagine that a3 is not a big deal to undermine uh, c3 so does white have to worry about a3 from black he actually just plays rook fd1 okay and now we see rook fc8 as though black is looking forward to torturing the c4 pawn uh, but here actually an interesting dynamic uh, move is is played uh, the move I wonder actually if you can guess it um, if I give you 10 seconds so if you want to play chess over please try and hide the notation tab uh, for these guess the moves if I give you 10 seconds or 20 seconds here what would you play here as white in this position uh, starting from now anyone no one no one's guessing at the moment okay let's move on <laughs> no one wants to make a guess knight d5 hack thomas knight d5 actually no no it wasn't knight d5 although knight d5 is possibly a good move as well um Queen H4, no, it's, it's white to play, white to play, white to play here at move 15. Um, ah, someone got it, okay, without, hopefully without looking at the move score, C5, which is quite dis disru disruptive, uh, so let's have a look. Now, it wasn't taken, but let's, let's imagine it was taken. I wonder E5 is annoying. Um, Actually, knight d7 is ruled out, isn't it? Because bishop takes, and then we can take on d7 here. That that will be hanging. So if e5, I wonder where the knight goes. Uh, knight e knight e8. Interesting position. Um, possibly you know maybe taking a knight d5 starts to look interesting um, so whatever the tactical reasons it wasn't actually accepted here black just played knight e8 okay protecting d6 it looks a bit passive c takes was played now knight takes d6 so white has got rid of that liability pawn and these rooks look quite lovely on c and d files now Control of d5 looks quite good. So all of white's pieces actually look quite pleasant. And now white plays knight d5. So he seems to have a nice position as white's here. Uh, bishop takes d5 was played. Rook takes, attacking the queen and allowing also, of course, a check. Rook takes c1, which is played. Bishop takes which of course protects b2 but b2 is already protected anyway it's not a big deal so where's the queen going to move goes to c7 okay so and now bishop f4 so again in these bishops still look quite neat maybe there's e5 e6 on the cards and black here volunteers an exchange of queens with queen c4 and actually this this was um accepted by Kasparov he took the Queens off and for the moment okay b2 is under fire so he kicks the Knight with b3 and where's the Knight going now after a takes a takes there is the possibility of a check you might think but it is weakening the, the, the back row and you don't want to run into this so the checks not not a big deal because there's Bishop f1 um, so actually knight a5 is played here and white does seem to be emerging with this um, you know advantage um, here b4 knight c6 b5 the pawn just goes on and so what, what is going on here because now um, 
it looks as though also rook d7 might be a menace as well uh, knight d4 okay and um, here okay this continual threat check is is sort of in advance uh, something is done about it bishop f1 protecting that pawn so the rook is now ready to leave actually the protection of the pawn from the knight um, and also the check is not a check and maybe you know the king can unpin if needed uh, so even plays h5 now and the king goes to g2 so we still see this renewal of kind of a threat of rook d7 looks like a menace on the cards here uh, for black and if we knock out this pawn of course then this pawn looks destined for a bright future guided by that bishop on f4 knight c2 so what is this doing you might wonder is there some poxy check or is it something else bishop d2 looks as though it does rule out actually knight e1 and still renews you know white seems to have this rook d7 hanging over black e6 but now actually the knight's victimized with rook c5 knight d4 bishop e3 okay so rook c7 looks like a threat on the cards so maybe b6 uh, was against that the rook goes to c7 in any case eyeing f7 but also rook b7 might be useful and also rook d7 this bishop is very usefully supporting that b5 pawn here rook a1 check king h7 and now rook c7 attacking f7 so why can't the king just go back to protect f7 it does king g8 so how can white make progress here he picks on the knight again he plays rook c4 the, the knight is protected okay it's a bit of cat and mouse <laughs> isn't it really how is white making progress he plays a check again is he going to go back to c7 no actually this new position uh, facilitates quite a nasty pin and this is approaching move 40 now so you can expect more blunders more terrible blunders as as they approach move 40 uh, usually in fide time controls move 40 you get the extra time so this nasty pin doesn't look actually very uh, desirable at all and in fact uh, there's immediate like there's an immediate almost threat here um, on the cards uh, to exploit that pin uh, Bishop e5 was played and at the moment can you see a way of exploiting uh, this pin it doesn't quite actually it doesn't quite work here so let's maybe let's get get to that moment in the game um, f4 does look like a good move someone's mentioned uh, on twitch um, yeah see at the moment I don't want to spoil it for later so let's carry on the game h3 is played king g7 now the king looks as though it's it's on a dark square which could be useful uh, tactically that the king's on a dark square here bishop c4 which kind of maybe is less vulnerable than on f1 um, in some respects and also maybe rook d7 and you know maybe taking bishop e6 could be useful so king f6 um, and now rook d7 which which kind of implies actually uh, it does seem to imply pardon me I mean even here it, it looks as though like f4 was was dangerous but perhaps king e7 is the answer here to evict the rook uh, so maybe that's why f4 wasn't chosen here because Marv plays king, rook d7 so it looks as though this threat is is created of playing f4 to undermine the d4 knight 
so f if f four is a threat, okay, it seems to be parried anyway with this next move. So maybe that's the main thing to stop f four from white. But now here the pin uh, seems to be uh, more exploitable. Uh, so if you if I give you uh, ten sorry twenty seconds, can you spot what does white play here at move forty? Uh, there's another sort of weakness in the black camp that has crept in, another liability you could call it, as a clue. Seems some panic has set in with this pin. Anyone? Okay, um, well this pin's nasty. Okay, I think some of you guessed it. Um, bishop e2. Bishop e2. Uh, it does seem to fork actually h5 and d1. Uh, so, um, if rook e1, does f4 win the knight? Let's have a look. F4, does it win the knight? It looks close. There's knight c2 here. No, it's F takes e, check. Knight c2 doesn't work for knight e3. That's interesting. Why does an F fall in the night? <laughs> that looks pretty bad, doesn't it? F four, in any case. Does anyone see a defence here? That looks pretty strong actually, F four. <laughs> Come to think, I can't, I can't see because F4, you know, looks pretty menacing as well. Um, no one can see a defence for that. Huh? The knight seems to be pretty loose. If knight F5 or knight C2, it's it's check, isn't it? It's check. Oh, I see. Actually, the bishop and the rook are hanging. All oh, right, that's quite clever, isn't it? Wow. So if, if rook takes d1, there's check, bending the material back, which would be a disaster for white. Blimey, knight f5. Wow. So allowing f takes e5 check. Is knight c2 even stronger here? Let's try knight c2. Check. So the rook and the knight and the bishop. Blimey, that that's quite an amazing tactical trap, isn't it? Isn't this quite ingenious that f4 doesn't work? That's quite ingenious, isn't it? For knight c2, <laughs> bit of a backfire, isn't it, on the rook and the bishop? Wow. Amazing. So maybe that's 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 part of the reason this this, this other move was chosen instead. Bishop e2. Uh, and instead of losing uh, the h pawn, uh, even to, he decided to lose the exchange. He played knight takes e2, losing the exchange. So knight c3. The exchange up now. Uh, but is is black going to get a pawn? For the exchange, could this this pawn come down? Rook d8, and also he's he's kind of forking these two pawns. The pawn for the exchange. Knight takes e4. He takes that one actually. Uh, bishop takes. Nope. It's still the exchange up. Exchange for a pawn if he gets b5. 
Rook g8 seems to carry with it a menacing threat of bishop d8 to get g5 now. And in fact, after knight takes b5, bishop d8 check, Ivanchuk resigns here. I think he's losing material actually, because uh, he resigned here. Let's imagine check and f4 here. It seems these pieces are skewered. So there's a bit of um, a lot of tactics in this game. Um, Uh, you know, if, if black tries to rig, we can just play rook takes and keep this um, skewer. So that was a bit of an advanced English <laughs> opening game, which uh, let's, I don't know what we can get. F I hope we can sort of simulate this play sometime if we play the English opening. It was um, knight takes c6, maybe was the first kind of surprise looking move. c5 seemed quite energetic as well. And White's advantage here, uh, he didn't mind this end game. His rook kind of was very uh, active, and he sort of created something bigger advantage here with this pin, this huge pin on the file. And there are all sorts of problems being set soon. Um, so um, d7, g5, bishop e2. Now, if if sorry, we should say if rook e1. I wonder if um, just bishop takes h5 here threatens rook f7 mate. So this one and this one. You know, say say the knight moves. This is mate, isn't it? Mate. So this this. You know when g5 was played here, that, that's really quite significant, that h5. See? It's quite significant, isn't it? g5 for weakening the position. Okay, so should we go on to another game? Um, I'll put um, the PGNs will be in the YouTube. If you look on, on YouTube later on YouTube King's Crusher, check the PGNs. Maybe, maybe this is worthy of, of study uh, in much more depth with an engine. I think we're just touching on some of the variations here. Uh, so let's let's have a look at another game. Uh, so log, someone called Loginov in this game, uh, playing for UZB. So what's what's the country code for UZB? Does anyone know? Anyway, Kasparov was right was white against Loginov. Funny enough, I've not heard of logging off recently has anyone else he, he was 2540 at the time Uzbekistan um, 12 Freeman writes on, on on stream um, I've, has anyone heard of logging off recently I, I don't remember <laughs> okay so d4 so logging off chooses a King's engine defense and you know um, Interestingly, right, in this Olympiad, uh, Kramnik uh, had a brilliant rating performance as well. And when he played against King's Engines, he also played uh, this next move, F3, the Simish uh, variation against the King's Engine. Um, which, you know, the, ba the basic idea, you, you know, you play Bishop E3, Queen D2, then later bishop h6, uh, h4, h5 takes, uh, it takes, and sort of queen h6 mating. So that's the basic idea of the Simish. <laughs> it's a sort of h file hack attack, potentially. So after castles, bishop e3. Um, so white's preparing, uh, you know, queen d2. But black in the meantime can try and generate counterplay uh, against c4. So a6 looks like a logical move for black in this variation. Queen d2. Now knight c6 usually has with it the idea of e5. Um, and maybe, you know, knight, knight a5 sometimes. So knight g e2, rook b8. This was popular for a long time, this variation. h4, b5. 
So C4 has been victimized. And um, one of the beauties of this system, as I'm, I had a few good wins with the Simish, um, and sometimes you leave C4 as a pawn sacrifice just to speed up your own attack. And here C4 is used as a pawn sacrifice. So White just ignores C4, he just plays H5. So White really wants to get a good hack attack on the H file. You know, exchange off the bishops and make black quite quickly. So that's the basic idea. Uh, so is is the C4 pawn worth worrying about? No, black plays E5. He'd rather he'd rather take that C4 with a knight actually to victimize these two. So D5, knight A5. Okay. But um, still, the pawn sacrifice is renewed just with an option here of taking on c4 with this bishop, with this next move, knight g3. So you can take that pesky knight. Um, but black here uh, thinks, well, the knight, okay, doesn't have to take. He can, he can still take like this and use the knight. Maybe tactically on b3, and this b file might be useful. So he plays b, takes c4. White castles queenside. Okay, rook b4. So white exchanges off the dark square bishops. The attacking plan is carrying on. Black voluntarily took there to sort of decoy the queen over there. Um, queen e7. For the moment, the queen can also defend laterally uh, like this, h7 if needed. Okay, so white needs more fuel on the h file, doesn't he? Bishop e2, so connecting rooks now. And um, actually, bishop e2 is not just about collecting rooks. This knight is free to move, and then that pawn might move. So bishop d7, knight f1, the point is revealed that the knight can come here. This pawn can come here now. Rook fb8. Okay, there's some matters to, to be concerned about here. So protecting this pawn. C5. Okay, C5. And in this position, curiously, um, this is this is a, a kind of um, in, interesting uh, move. Bishop uh, D1. What on earth is Bishop D1 doing? Maybe the rook, you know, is going to become useful later once the G pawn moves. Knight E8, and now White pills open because Black might lock the Queen in with G5. That would be cheeky, wouldn't it? So takes, uh, giving the Queen an escape route back if needed, and now G4, and we we can see that the rook can come over here. Queen g7. Okay. Now this is quite interesting here, this next move, um, because as a sort of the, the pattern of the game goes, uh, you would have thought White's going for some sort of crude uh, attack, uh, preferably with the Queen's on. Can you guess what White played here? It's not a spectacular looking move. What did white play here? I'll give him a little bit of a clue. If I give you 20 seconds. So white is content to play what move here to kind of maintain pressure on the king side. Maybe some of you will find it surprising. 20 seconds. No, so it's not it's not queen takes queen, um, or or this. Actually, this next move, uh, g5, it marks out. It prevents this knight using f6. 
So now, you know, rook h2 is going to have more impact with that knight getting in the way. Because you can imagine knight h5, if it's allowed, you play g5 later, there'll be knight h5. Um, so g5, not minding the exchange of queens. So queen takes, was played, rook takes. And the knight plays knight g7 here. But, how, you know, how does black defend against this doubling on h7? Without the use of the f6 square, how does black defend this? Does he defend like this? Maybe that's possible. He played knight g7. I, I wonder here if um, if if we if we try rook b7 as defence, you know, rook h2, bishop c8. Would this have been terrible? Bishop a4. What do you do about this? Oh blimey! Isn't black overloaded? Black's overloaded here. Bishop a4 could be a killer resource, actually. Because <laughs> how do you defend h7? You can't move here because you're going to lose h7. Oh, man. What do you think about this? Wouldn't this be a disaster? Bishop d7, you just take... Oh, hang on. No, you got a point. Bishop d7. Hang on, let's look at bishop d7. What, why is rook takes a4 forced, uh, sake, sake in a win? I don't know. Actually, okay. Hold on. Let's go back here. Is is I'm just I'm just coming up with Bishop A4. I haven't actually engine checked this game. How does how does White play this if not Bishop A4? Um, Knight E3 could be useful as well. Okay, it was just an idea, but it, okay, it seems Bishop A4, Bishop D7 initially, unless anyone can prove otherwise. Uh, so that that might not be so hot, but uh, it seems Black rejected this defensive idea of Rook B7 here. He played actually Knight G7. Maybe you know his idea is is to play Knight H5, but Xbrov played here um, F4, so he's actually marking out H5, and he's sacking this pawn, which is taken. So the Rooks double without Knight H5, you know, can be eliminated now. Rook E8, and the Rooks seem to. Uh, well, he doesn't even take on h7 immediately here. Um, he plays actually knight d2. So let's follow the game now. Quite complex. What seems to be a crude h file attack has turned into some sort of mystery. Why he's delaying h7 captures. Uh, so rook e there, but now he takes on h7. The rooks are finally crashing through, and he's giving up b2 here. Okay, now, oh, this is a cunning move here, though. So instead of immediate check, guess what uh, Kasparov plays here? Uh, so this is, I think it's much stronger than the immediate check on, on h8. So white to play here. Uh, what would you play here with white? 20 seconds starting from now. Um, nope, no one's guessed the move here. Come on, wake up. Come on, come on, think. Look, the king's going to be on the f-file, yeah, if you play a check. How do you make rook h8 more effective? You want to make rook h8 check have more effectiveness to it. Yeah, how? Rook h6? No. 
Uh, okay, rook h, rook two to h four. He wants to grab that. So check and then grab this. So let's see how the game turns out. The rook retreats. Check. You take an f four now without the rook hanging. The rook otherwise would be hanging. Yeah. King seven. Nasty pin. Pin and win. Light again seven check. There was a knight pin if you remember previous game. Okay, so this queen the sage file attack has finally got a big advantage, hasn't it? Rook g8 and now rook f6. Black is defenseless it seems against almost there's bishop e8 or is there rook e6 or is there e5? It's all probably crashing through. Bishop e8 was played and now thematic looking pawn sacrifice um, e5 which you know if this is taken huge pawn you know huge knight on e4 d6s uh, so it's not taken here rook b6 but that is in clear trouble here knight d e4 beautiful stuff look at this very very powerful knight another pin here pin here pin and win so uh, knight b7 uh, E takes d6, check. Knight takes d6, and now using the pin on the knight, he plays rook e6, check. And black, playing king d7, also resigns. So why does he resign after playing king d7? Uh, 20 seconds, can you spot what white could play here to win? Um, can you? Come on, white to play and win. Come on, basic check. It's a check. It's a knight check. There's a clue. <laughs> knight F E. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Some of you guessed it. Yeah, check. You got a fork. On the rook, poor rook. So after king d7, he resigned. So okay. Um, honestly, was this an instructive game or not for the Simish King's engine player? It sort of is, isn't it? Because it shows uh, you can carry on having a persistent attack even when your queen gets exchanged, and it shows some nifty manoeuvring actually. So let's have a quick look at that again. Um, so I actually I knew about the concept of sacrificing c4 but there's a lot of really other clever stuff here in this game um, which which means this is a really really dangerous system um, actually so you castle queen side exchange off the bishops so bishop e2 um, is, is, is looking like a, a really interesting move Bishop e2 actually for what happens uh, next for this Knight f1 so what is going on this this re this sort of reshuffling of pieces now Rook d2 and then we saw Bishop d1 and in some variations that's actually useful in other variations this is useful Rook h2 Finally, g5 might trap the queen, embarrassingly, so taking on g6. Now g4, because that, that knight g3 did make way for g4, and also the rook h2. So queen g7, g5 keeps the knight out of f6. Queen takes, rook takes. So this rook b7 defense uh, wasn't played. Do any of you really want to spend time cracking rook b7? here. Uh, Shall we spend a bit of time seeing if we can refute rook b7 um, briefly. So in the game we saw that knight g7 was played or, or should we should we just go on to another game soon? If we, okay should we give it five minutes? F five minutes yeah? Rook b7 what, what can we do here? 
so we we imagine this is the next move bishop c8 and bishop a4 doesn't seem to do the trick does it because black has the tactical bishop d7 correct Well, can anyone give an attacking plan which will break the defences? A3. A3. Really? Okay. Alright, let's, let's put the rook. Ah, oh, I see. Well, there was knight b3, but actually bishop a4 might be strong here. Hmm. Knight a4. No one's totally sure maybe someone should engine check this or something so the rooks are kind of committed aren't they to h7 um, could this have been the miscalculation because it seems bishop d7 holds here doesn't it Okay, let's let's move on to another game. Um, that's something to as homework. <laughs> can someone find out for next week? Maybe I can mention it next week. <laughs> I don't know, um, but it, so we saw in the game the defense knight g7 didn't work out very well. The f4 move made sure the bishop was covering h5, and then this thematic break in the center was really crushing. Rook h4 made sure that when the check happens get a nasty pin so e f e5 coming up so first rook f6 putting starting to put the pressure on now e5 looks really thematic and black's position starts crumbling so tactically uh, he resigned here because of knight f6 so okay let's go on to another game So Pedrog Nikolic, so B I H. Uh, so what's the country code? B I H. Ni Pe Pedrog Pred Predrag uh, Nikolic was was two six three five in this game. So it's twenty seven eighty. Bosnia, okay, Bosnia, great. So uh, D four, okay, by Kasparov, and we see, ah, uh, no, we see one of these boring Slavs in this game. But actually, no, something's very exciting already is going to happen here, right? This is going to take you all by surprise, isn't it? It wasn't, um, it, it wasn't knight f6. Um, it, it wasn't e6. No, it was actually e5. e5, isn't that amazing? e5. The sort of uh, Albin counter gambit mixed in with the Slav. I've, I don't think I've used this much. What do you think about this? Do you think it's rubbish? <laughs> Isn't it combining two ideas, the Slav with the Albion counter gambit? A 2-6-3-5 thought this was interesting anyway. It's called the Winnower counter gambit, is it? Who said that? <laughs> so anyway, Kasparov took it uh, so d4, knight e4, and black can regain the pawn it seems with check uh, regaining the pawn. <laughs> yeah, a new gambit for war zone or, or blitz on. So bishop d2, queen takes e5. So hitting the knight, uh, the knight moves to g3. Uh, queen goes to d6 
knight f3, knight f6. So black's played quite excitingly. Queen c2. It looks as though the problem uh, sometimes with with d4 is is these light squares are a bit weakened. You can see this knight and queen are called knight on f5 already. Bishop e7. The white castles queen side here. Also, it seems d4 might be a victim soon with this rook against the queen. Black castled. e3. Black took. And actually, instead of bishop takes e3, uh, Kasparov played f takes e3. Maybe you know he wants his bishop here. Maybe he wants the f file as well. Queen c7. In fact, it does kind of reveal itself here. Bishop c3. He did, does like the bishop here, pointing at that knight. Doesn't mind the pawn uh, island. Okay. Bishop g4 and now Bishop d3. So intensifying the pressure. Look at these bishops. Quite cute. Knight bd7 and exchanging off the light square bishop will help f5 domination. Spoff likes his knights on f5. That's his favourite knight square, f5. And he's got it along with the bishop, along with d file pressure. Rook f8. And now it sort of becomes. Um, kind of sparkling continuation. Can you guess what white plays here if I give you 20 seconds? Uh, so a clue, we could have been looking at a towel game uh, equally. So 20 seconds starting from now. Anyone? White play? Yeah, yeah. The knight, you know, I mean, what's a knight? You know, you can sacrifice a knight for two pawns. Who cares? Yeah? Everyone knows that. Yeah? <laughs> so, <laughs> so king takes g7. Uh, queen f5 now. And it looks as though, like... This well, this diagonal is pretty nasty. Um, so uh, knight f8. Uh, also, rook takes d7 is immediately on the cards because we've got this nasty pin. So in fact, rook takes d7 is probably the main point actually. <laughs> that the queen is not enough to defend d7 here. So the knight moves away, uh, but the attack uh, kind of persists with h4. If if there was um, queen g5, then you know maybe knight g6. So h4 brings in you know more stuff into the attack. H6 and now g4. So these pawns look pretty menacing. G5 to regain material. Queen c8. And again a surprising move, right? You have the attack. Do you automatically assume? Uh, you want to keep the queens on. Guess what Gasparov plays here? What does he play here? If I give you 20 seconds. Can we... A, a clue from a previous game. Anyone? That's a simple move. He, he doesn't mind the exchange of queens, I'll, I'll reveal. He doesn't mind. He's going to get his piece back with advantage anyway. You know, he's got this g-file. Yeah. He's getting his piece back. And he's in no rush to take on f6. He plays e4 here. Um, so what, what on earth does e4 do? It prepares maybe, you know, taking an e5. So even even more effective than g takes, you know, bishop takes. You know, what's the big deal here? But if you've got a pawn on e4, you can play e5. So e4, rook cd8, keeps the pin. Rook df1, 
king moves out. Now he's got to take on f6, surely. And he does. Bishop takes. And now e5. Very powerful move. e5. Bishop d7. The rook eyes the bishop as though something horrible is on the cards here against this bishop. c5. That does sort of. Um, I don't know. Is it? It seems tactically that there's not nothing going on here because Parv played King C2 here. So yeah, this knight's been shut out of the game, isn't it? This knight from these two pawns. Rook E6, Rook G4, as though maybe you know doubling up rooks. Bishop moves out of the way. B4 playing on the queen side as well. Of course, this would be a new attacking diagonal against the king. Uh, so b6, he takes on c5, and actually a new road. He uses the b file, he does use the b file. Can he come down like this? Just keep this one here. Rook a6, rook b2 defending a2. Bishop goes back, knowing that what's the rook doing over here now? But rook b7 looks as though f7 is a new target for e6s so you can imagine some sort of disaster is brewing here and indeed um, black's next move doesn't really help against e6 he plays check which allows king b3 giving a valuable tempo now to play now e6 so rook takes f7 is threatened which would be mating uh, potentially as well as bishop takes g7 and rook takes g7 say bishop takes then you know this is mating so basically um, e6 is really powerful he's losing actually he just loses a piece after rook takes rook takes g7 uh, end of game um okay so that that was uh <laughs> finding di different roads to the king here this 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 b file business was kind of intriguing let's have a quick look at that again uh so he coped well with this novel opening from black uh so what did he do in a nutshell he castled queenside he didn't mind pawn island because he wanted this bishop on this diagonal, it belonged on this diagonal. Um, I heard that recently, actually, in, in one of those uh, live streams for the World Championship match. Uh, Zvidla was saying about bishop belonging on c3 in a certain hanging pawns position. I quite like that. So the bishop belongs on c3. No need for poxy. Bishop takes e3. Give yourself a pawn line. Is okay sometimes. Um, and the pawn is is quite useful anyway. You know when it went up later. So bishop d3, <clears throat> so bishop f5, get rid of the right square bishop. Um, sorry, someone's wondering what would happen if bishop a2 was followed by bishop rook f2. Alright, we'll get to that again, hold on a sec. Oh, I've lost my move score, great, hold on. Sorry, so let's just get my move score recovered. So a big knight on f5 knight sacrifice tower like and then casually just flinging the pawns to regain the peace even after exchange of queens actually you know uh, so these pieces were kind of stuck um, now interestingly you know what if if black black was worried about bishop b4 check wasn't he because otherwise the king stuck on that g file again so c5 was was a defensive move against bishop b4 check. Uh, it just so happens that this b file was an amazing inroad later to black's king anyway. So king c2, uh, and we saw um, rook g4, okay, and then b4 with the rook coming in on the b file now. Uh, so rook b2 
and after bishop g7 now rook b7 is a lot more attractive so someone has mentioned um about check and rook f2 instead of rook a6 is that rook f2 c5 was to stop bishop b4 check because the king didn't want to go back on the g file but rook f2 here Don't you just play e6? What do, what do we play against rook f2? Don't we just play e6 anyway? So rook takes. Okay, we can't play that. It's pinned. We can play check. No, we can't. No, hang on. Rook takes f7. We've got e7 check here, haven't we? Look at this. e7 check. So we can, we can get this bishop first with check, yeah, and then you know, that's not nice, is it? E7, yeah. Sorry, who said rook f4? Rook f4? Rook f4? Where? In the game, e6 was crushing. Uh, what move for rook f4 Sejina win after rook f2 but e6 doesn't that look better yeah um all right so we're about an hour in and we've looked at three games but i did want to look at some kramnik games i don't know if this is too slow the pace it's actually quite hot here in the uk but um do you want to have a look at another game? Uh, anyone? <clears throat> or, or should we carry on next week? Yeah? Uh, uh, let's have a look. Um quite hot here <laughs> it's, it's it's actually I don't know we've got peak weather conditions now um, temperature uh, uh, I'm tempted for this Kramnik game I think I could do this Kramnik game in the King's Engine I saw this in a, a chess magazine a chess monthly I think Let's, let's go over one more game Kramnik win yeah uh, so this this because actually this is kind of topical I think Sparrow from Kramnik was sharing a repertoire here with, with the Simish against the King's Engine so he's playing against John Nunn who was like um, he's one of the major you know grandmaster exponents of the King's Engine defence John Nunn at the time was 2615 playing for England so against Kramnik who was a FIDE master but rated 2590 so Kasparov managed to put Kramnik in the team and he was only a FIDE master at the time but FIDE haven't caught up on his titles yet because at 2590 he was higher rated than a lot of GMs so a d4 from Kramnik so I remember this and it was, I was sort of stunned by it and uh, my good friend Chris uh, Chess Explained um, who's soon to be an IM by the way, um, was mentioning to me it's as if uh, Vladimir was out drinking all of the night before as well and didn't spend much time on his moves. Um, I don't know if anyone can, can verify that, that story. Uh, is this really true? Because when I saw this game in, in Chess Monthly, I thought it was like amazing. Yeah, so let's have a look. So it was a Simish King's Engine. See, they're sharing the, the same repertoire. Him and Kasparov in this tournament. This Simish against the King's Engine uh, is really dangerous, isn't it? Um, so Bishop E3, uh, but now C5. And, you know, this is a critical test. So go into some weird gambit. But um, 
you know, Kramnik's up for it. He 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 doesn't play. He doesn't chicken out with d5. You know, which which would give you know black dark square control and easy you know b5 plan later. No, he he takes the pawn, which is a critical test, and he gets the queens off, and he just takes the pawn. He's pawn up. Okay, but it, it, there's tons of theory on this position. Um, but at the time, not so much theory as today, 1992. So knight c6. And the bishop's kept on this diagonal. Okay, bishop a3. So it's keeping control of b4. a5, rook d1. Bishop e6. So black has connected rooks. Pressure on c4. There's some dynamic compensation here for black. Knight d5. So uh, is is actually e7 on the cards now. Uh, John Nunn takes it. He plays bishop takes d5. Um, by the way, uh, just sorry, this is totally irrelevant. But John Nunn, uh, I won the Lloyd's uh, National Under 18 uh, in 1989. I uh, remember John Nunn, he presented me my, my junior trophy. It was really cool that day. And so after that, also, um, had quite a lot of girls um, just after me that day. <laughs> it was quite funny. I don't know. Uh, so I'm carrying on with the game, though. C it was a brilliant day. You know, every dog has his day. <laughs> so C takes D5. So I, I'm fond of John Nunn, anyway, in the King's Indian defence. And to have him give me the junior um, trophy was a real honour. So, <laughs> so knight, knight b4. Um, so I should really do some more John Nunn games, actually, for the YouTube channel. Because although he's not a top-level GM nowadays, uh, the last time I, I spoke to him, actually, at London Classic, well, he's more into astro astronomy, like Anand. And I think he, fi he might be finding it quite heavy going. He's into puzzles and competi compositions, of course. So he's world champion at puzzles for, for a few years and compositions. But um, he was a brilliant King's Engine player. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this, this game wasn't one of his best King's Engine games, as we're about to see. So Bishop e5, um, which invites Knight c2 check. But the King's got a square here. Um, or maybe even here. So knight c2 check, king f2. So we've got, unfortunately, a very strong pawn chain. And, you know, even though these pawns might be looking terrible, this bishop wasn't doing much on the diagonal. Uh, so it is it is taken here, b takes. But how do we, you know, assess uh, this position? Uh, who do you think stands better here, uh, white or black? Uh, if I give you 10 seconds, let's do an evaluation um, of this position. So white is um, a pawn up, but these pawns are doubled. So what do you think? Uh, okay, 20 seconds. Black has more play. White. Someone says white. Definitely white. Black has no targets. Second on right, on the page has. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, complex. Black chooses e6. Maybe that's. A little mistake here. Um, what would Black's plan be? If not e6, he's trying to weaken that his d pawn. It looks like a risky strategy. You know, if if knight d7, um, you know, maybe you know, maybe knight e2, and then rook c1, and then this c file is going to be a pain. So anyway, in the game e6 was played, and we saw d6. Now e5, 
knight e2 and now bishop f8 victimizing this pawn and is this you know diagonal going to be useful is this this pawn but um you know maybe cram the you know apparently he had been drinking the night before maybe he's not bothered about the a3 pawn he just plays d7 um so he gives up a3 and um so this is now a pawn sacrifice for this huge mighty pawn on d7 supported by that mighty bishop uh, but one question you know what about what about something like this trying to evict the bishop can the bishop be evicted um on the other hand okay it's white's move here he plays g4 and it looks as though um so g4 what is the idea of g4 here it looks as though may, maybe you know g5 get this knight away and then knight c3 to d5 so h6 looks as though g5 was a concern and that concern is renewed with h4 so g5 on the cards here undermining d5 so positional pawn sacrifice so far it looks as though it revolves around the use of the d5 square and this huge pawn on d7 so um a4 which looks as though rook a5 is introduced as a tactical resource to evict the bishop to weaken the pawn um but now rook d3 is played so okay we're attacking this bishop um, now in the game actually uh, bishop b2 was played uh, but can anyone sm uh, spot uh, would sorry would rook I guess this is a terrible move rook a5 um, it looks as though white you know th this move maybe this is refutable is it uh, how would we refute rook a5 or do we need to I, I d wouldn't say about taking a pawn um, because we're going to lose d7 what about yeah just rook b1 rook b1 so maybe it's not a big deal there's a check there is a check king g2 We've still got this threat of g5. That's okay for white, isn't it? And then knight c3 and then knight d5. That would look quite menacing. So, so let's go back. So after rook d3, bishop b2 was played, and we get this g5 now. So do we have enough positional compensation here? Took took knight h7. And now it looks as though g5 can't be protected, surely, because f4 you can just take, surely. But in in fact, in this position, f4 was played. Because you might think, you know, about this, you know, but um, yeah, this is the big problem. It would be attacking the knight, wouldn't it? How, where's the knight going? Uh, so let's have a look at that. So takes here. Knight takes. We've actually got h8 covered. So let's go back. Hold on a sec. So if e takes f4, what would white play here? Anyone? He didn't play e takes f4. Um, rook a5 was played in the game. Uh, so what's the refutation of e takes f4? Who knows? Does anyone know? Benko Gamton, maybe something with bishop c4, rook g1, rook g3, rook g1 meekly. Rook g1 meekly. Knight takes f4.
No, I don't know. This doesn't sound convincing, Rook G1, is it? Pin and win Bishop C4. Bishop C4. Knight takes G5. No, surely not. Bishop C4. Rook D5, someone saying Sagnaman. Rook D5. Really? Actually, um, you know, ma maybe, because then uh, Knight takes F4. Um, I don't know. Ah, that's another tricky question. E takes f4. <laughs> e takes f4. Bishop c4 and rook d6, maybe. No. Um, see it oh okay I think um, uh, Bishop c4 knight takes f4 okay, let's go on to the game <laughs> okay so in the game rook a5 was played and rook d5 was played so maybe rook d5 would have been played given it was played here because uh, it's needed to protect b5 anyway isn't it as well as g5 so possibly rook d5 was the idea. Uh, now after f6, uh, this does block in the bishop a little bit more on the diagonal. So white played um, an amazing looking move here, spectacular. Yeah, Pro probably it was rook d5 because that was played in the game. Because because this rook a5 is a resource that needs to be respected from the opponent to attack the bishop. So you might as well play rook d5. It's dual purpose, isn't it? But here, what did white play here now in this position? So white's play. Uh, guess what he played here, if I give you 20 seconds, starting from now. Uh, no, 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 it wasn't rook h6. Well, no, rook h6 might be strong actually. It wasn't rook b1. Now, it was a positional exchange sacrifice. Rook takes h7. Because, you know, look at all these pawns about to crash through. Uh, this, what, this is what made the game kind of stand out. Uh, so now, after king takes, g takes, we're getting pawn mobility here. Philidor, pawns of the soul of chess. If this pawn comes up here, that'd be pretty cool. E takes f4, e5. Look at these pawns. Amazing. Pawns of the soul of chess. So we've got three past pawns here all of a sudden in this position. Uh, king h6. Knight takes on f4. And black gets very desperate here, but I think it's a desperate position. Because uh, it looks as though knight e6 actually immediately is going to win material. Um, bishop takes e5 was played, knocking out the, the three connected pass pawns. Knocking out two of them actually, because now rook takes d7, because we've got this pin. So if we take, you know, rook takes e5, and f7 is king g7 maybe. So. That's actually, f7 is rook f5. So now what happens, actually this is this is the game continuation. Okay, so I don't need to make it up. Bishop takes d7 was played, in fact. Rook takes e5. And there's no, there's no rook f5, because the bishop's covering f5. So f7, um, 
was played anyway. And although there's a king d7 resource, black actually resigned here. So do you know why black resigned here? Uh, just to make this easier, let's assume in this position that rook f5 is ruled out. There's no rook e8, so let's assume king g7. What would white play here to win? This is a bit of a cute tactic. So 20 seconds starting from now, can you guess what white could play here to win? Well, it's actually, there's, there's probably two moves at least. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's two moves, you know. So I was, I was looking at the more spectacular f8. Uh, you can do that as well. Um, or you can just, it seems I think you can just play um, knight takes g6. Yeah, with the pawn queening. So that that was a that was an interesting game. Um, that was stunning at the time. I saw that in Chess Monthly magazine, and that was quite impressive at the time. So um, Kramnik was getting this reputation as a positional monster, uh, a positional giant already, and this is back in 1992. And this this was how he kind of accepted the gambit, and kind of not only accepted double pawns, he sort of made his own gambit soon his own gambit here for what seemed to be strange compensation initially but the pawns all crashed through didn't they in the game continuation with this fantastic move f4 he's he's really getting these pawns going uh, so he's, we can assume actually e takes f4 rook d5 you know covers rook a5 possibilities so white will just take here and then maybe carry on with the pawn at some point. But in the game continuation, a powerful, very powerful exchange sacrifice. So the pawn mobility was hugely emphasized here, here in this position. Free pass pawns emerged very suddenly. Uh, so very difficult to cope with. And this, this tactic just backfired here f7 is really strong so um, I yeah I hope you got something from these games um, I'll upload to YouTube Com Kings Crusher of course uh, so YouTube Com Kings Crusher uploading soon yeah okay thanks very much um, I'll see you next week Tuesday same time 7 o'clock London time 8 o'clock Germany time thanks very much Okay, until next week. Thanks so much.